Uh, we're going to get started today. Thank you for being patient. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the Human Resource Management Panel. Uh, my name is Cassidy Shafford, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Uh, this afternoon, we have exceptional guests who are here to speak to you about the fascinating world of business. And we would like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Indigenous people of the land which we meet on, the Mi'kmaq people. Mount St. Vincent University is built on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. We also pay respect to the knowledge embedded in the Aboriginal custodians of this land and to the elders, past, present, and future. So before we get started, we just have a couple hosts keeping items we want to talk about. Uh, in case of an emergency, uh, we just like everybody to evacuate in the nearest fire exit. So that way, that way. And we encourage nobody to exit through the top doors. If you have to leave but from a personal emergency, please take the time to exit through the bottom doors. Uh, as many of you know, this is a learning passport eligible event. Uh, in order to keep things efficient, we just ask that you complete your survey and activity booklet page before the end where you will get your stamp from Miriam. If you didn't bring your passport or don't have it yet, we have activity pages for you to fill out. And we ask you please to all turn off or mute your cell phones and please do not go on them while our speakers are talking. <laughs> I guess that includes our speakers. <laughs> Um, yes, and we will have a designated time for questions at the end of the panel, so please postpone any questions you have to the end. Uh, yeah, awesome. So we'll get started. Uh, so question one, we'll start at the end. Uh, please introduce yourself and take a few minutes to tell us about where you work today, your role, and how you made your way into the field of HRM. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katerina Hackinson. I'm an HR operations manager for Lindsay Construction. At Lindsay Construction operates in the Atlantic provinces, so I do HR for all four. Um, the way I got into HR, I did a commerce degree, and then I went and did an advanced diploma in HR management. I started in a very entry-level position with Shanex Healthcare, uh, doing payroll, benefits administration, kind of frontline employee relations. I was promoted through two roles with Shanex into different HR, kind of one was more of a business manager role, and then I went into corporate office and did an HR business partner role, where I got to do a lot with collective agreements and labor relations. Uh, collective bargaining, so if you're interested in unionized environments, I have some good stories. <laughs> um, after that, I decided to switch completely to a different industry and went to construction. So I went from dealing with nurses every day to construction workers every day, which is very different, uh, but very interesting. I started there as a generalist and about six months ago moved into a managerial position. So that's a little bit about me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Mullally, and I'm the Talent Acquisition Manager for Enterprise Holdings here in Atlantic Canada. So Enterprise, we're the largest transportation service provider in the world. So you'd know us by our brands of Enterprise Rent-A-Car, National and Alamo, but we also have truck and fleet and even, you know, sales divisions. Um, so I started with Enterprise about 16 years ago as a new graduate. I graduated with a BSc in Biology and a minor in Marketing. Um, but, uh, you know, originally when I came to our organization, I was looking for a company that I knew had a lot of different career paths because I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. Uh, so I worked in our rental management path for about two years. I received three promotions in that time um, before our position came up as a recruiting coordinator in our organization. I didn't have any formal training with respect to human resources, um, but I knew from my experiences with the company thus far that it could be a really interesting career path. So. I started as a coordinator, moved to supervisor, and now as a manager. So I oversee um, all of our external hiring for about our 70 rental locations here at Atlantic Canada and also manage our internal mobility process. So that's, you know, hiring and selection and onboarding, uh, employment branding, staffing plans, all of those responsibilities fall under myself. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Layla Khalil, and I'm the Vice President of Human Resources at East Coast Credit Union. Uh, we're the largest credit union, provincial credit union in Atlantic Canada with 18 locations across Nova Scotia, and we employ around 200 employees. So I started uh, kind of how I came into the HR field. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree in business and hospitality management, like some of you are doing in tourism. And I've always been passionate in being in human resources, kind of to be able to make a difference and, uh, and really shape the organization and the culture. So when I came to Canada with my partner 20 years ago, I enrolled in the MBA program at Dalhousie, and they had at that time a focus in human resources management. So you do a master's degree in HR. Uh, so I completed that degree, and then I, uh, my first job was at Acadia University in operations and some HR management. And then I moved to another university at Senefax in Anaganish, and uh, Again, I was you know, involved in the operations and uh, NHR and event management. And then I joined the credit union system in 2007, so 13 years ago, at one of the credit unions in Anaganish. They had three branches uh, around that area. And um, they didn't have an HR department, so this was newly created position, senior manager of human resources, and the CEO there took a chance on me in giving me that opportunity to uh, come into the credit union and establish an HR department and really from build the HR from the ground up. That was challenging and exciting at the same time. It was also a unionized environment. <laughs> so it added a different layer of complexity, but uh, uh, fast forward, you know, 13 years later, we amalgamated in 2016 with a larger credit union, East Coast Credit Union, and now we're the largest in Atlantic Canada. So it's been a journey. It, it's uh, very interesting, and I was involved in various aspects of the human resources uh, uh, field um, and sitting at the executive table. In 2011, I also completed the uh, Chartered Professional Human Resources designation. So, um, so I completed the knowledge exam and then the professional practice to be a designated HR professional. So that's kind of a, my story in a nutshell. Hi, my name is Leanne Dingwall. Um, I work at a company called Maple Wave. It's a technology-based company. Uh, I am also a part-time professor here at uh, Mount St. Benton, and I see two of my former students in the audience. Hi, nice to see you guys. Um, I, uh, like the others, have a, a varied um, background when it comes to HR. Uh, I didn't start. I did my undergrad at uh, SMU. Uh, with a focus in uh, marketing and human resources, um, but left there and joined uh, working in politics, uh, had a passion for that and a passion for Atlantic Canada, so moved to Ottawa and took one of those grunt jobs, worked my way through, uh, through the ranks and ended up ending my uh, career there by advising two different prime ministers over a course of 10 years, which was very exciting. Got to travel the world, got to do lots of things um, specific to natural resources in our environment, but also direct impact on the policy here reflected in Atlanta, Canada, which was very, very, uh, very, very fun. But through that, um, I had a desire to um, always work with people, um, and that's what politics is really about. It's about people and engagement and building relationships and coming to agreements and whatnot. Um, so I decided, well, I'm going to leave there and I'm going to, I'm going to test my waters in the nonprofit world. And I did that. Um, and it was wonderful. I uh, did programs. I uh, did a lot of work with the um, indigenous groups um, out west in building uh, breakfast programs all across remote First Nations communities and whatnot. And that was great. And then decided that it was time to go back and do my executive master's in human resources. Uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed in Ontario and then made my way back here. Um, did a couple of different things here and I joined Maple Wave about five years ago uh, and I haven't looked back. Um, that everything about human resources, uh, in my opinion, is about uh, culture, it's about impact, it's about people. Um, no day is the same, um, which I enjoy, not everyone does, uh, but no day is the same. Um, you're probably getting some snickerings here um, 
Friday was about, you know, pay, and today was about the coronavirus. So there are lots of different things uh, that happen in the role. But Maple Wave, just a little bit about my current job. I oversee the, the human resource function for the global operation, and we're based here in Halifax as headquarters. We have an office in uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg, and also the UK. Um, and we focus in the telco industry. Our, our technology is, is a platform um, that supports uh, tier two um, telcos in terms of all of their inventory management, their sales. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, question two. So the strategic role of HRM in organizations is an important topic. Uh, please share with us your perspective on this topic, including some examples from your career experiences about how human resource, ma resource management is strategic to the success of organizations. So we'll start with Erin. Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, all of the questions that I'll answer today really are coming from my perspective from the talent acquisition. Um, you know, my role is to ensure that we're bringing, you know, great people into the organization to help us reach our organizational goals. So um, the first thing, you know, to realize is that employees are always your most valuable asset regardless of the organization, you know, that you're in um, and understanding what your organizational goals are so those people, you know, can help contribute to that success. So, you know, at Enterprise, you know, our goals are, are very straightforward, you know, exceeding our customers' expectations, providing opportunities for our employees, the growth of the organization, and profitability. So, um, you know, my role within the organization um, is strategically bringing the right people into the right positions that are going to exceed our customers' expectations. And that we know when we do that, that's going to lead to growth within the organization. It's going to impact the bottom line of the organization and then that's going to create opportunities for the employees you know that we have so um not just bringing great people into the organization, but understand as well how you hire costs money to that organization and how you can have a return on that investment so hiring costs money losing people costs money, uh, especially top talent, that's gonna cost you a lot, um, and being able to showcase um, how you make that direct impact on the bottom line of your business. So I meet with our controller every month. I talk about our hiring process, where we're spending money, where that's effective, um, being able to speak to the measurables of everything that I do um, is something, is a way that I can show the value within the organization. So that's it essentially from a, a talent acquisition standpoint. Uh, well, very similar to Erin, so uh, as an HR professional in your organization, so if you choose that field in HR, um, you have to understand the business, uh, the operation, and, and, and really be able to develop programs and, uh, and HR initiatives that support you know, the direction of the business. So in my role, uh, when we develop our business plan, when we sit down with our uh, executives to see kind of wh what we need to achieve this year and uh, work on the budget, uh, you know, look at the direction of the, you know, of the credit union, um, you know, we're there discussing, you know, all the uh, HR uh, initiatives that we need to develop to support the achievement of the business objectives. So, for example, we're very much focused uh, over the next couple of years at the credit union with our digital transformation, and this is kind of in the banking industry and all the changes that are happening. So, uh, you know, HR is, is leading that change. We are, we are, you know, support the various departments, um, the, the implementation of different digital initiatives. Um, but, uh, and also, uh, like, providing different opportunities for our employees in terms of training. Uh, we're developing digital training for our staff this year, uh, creating new positions uh, in our new environment. Uh, so we, again, kind of recruitment and selection of top talent to support our business objectives. Uh, and also HR, um, not only as a strategic partner, but also as a change agent. So we support our people leaders in, uh, in ensuring staff understand why the changes are happening and, uh, um, and really supporting our staff in, um, in, in the different aspect of the change management and, uh, um, and providing them with those tools, um, you know, to be able to move kind of from 
one area to another area or upgrade skills and be able to uh, kind of develop themselves in their career progression. Um, and also we create different programs like the uh, uh, employee recognition program. So from the recognition and uh, uh, pay and incentive. So how we empower our employees and how we encourage them to uh, um, participate internally. So HR is a very integral point in all aspects of the business. And, um, um, and also for uh, you know, creating policies that support um, you know, the different areas of our credit union. Um, I mean, I think both of you hit on most of the key points there. Um, I, I think one of the most, um, one topic that is often discussed in the HR world and in the business world now is that HR used to be here, it is now here. It is considered a strategic partner. And I would say to you, um, companies, if you're interested in HR, um, it, companies that don't value HR today are, are missing the boat. Um, HR is absolutely needed at the table, at the leadership table. Um, everything that every company is doing, whether you are going through digital transformation or not, um, or you're looking at the company is becoming more digital overall in terms of introducing AI and whatnot, people still matter and people will still be running and, and, and part of organizations. And today, one of the number one challenges for all companies is talent. And Aaron hit on, on a lot of that about talent acquisition and the value of that and how everything you know, that, that she touches impacts overall talent. So HR is definitely a strategic partner and should be at the table. And if the company that you're looking at or with or whatnot doesn't value that, then um, I view that as, as a problem because Those are all re really great points, so I'll try to say something a bit different, but for us, in the, so in the construction industry specifically, HR is fairly new. And so where we're saying HR is moving forward and companies are really adopting HR as a strategic partner, cons the construction industry in Atlantic Canada, specifically in the company I work for, has really only had a structured HR department for about the last 10 years. And so when I started, we went into a full department restructure. And so we wiped it clean and we said, this is what we did in the past, which was paperwork, 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 paperwork. And it was reactive. So I said I was a glorified firefighter because I was putting out fires every day, but I wasn't actually doing anything that was of benefit to tomorrow. And so for me, strategic HR is looking at being proactive. How do I take these HR processes and align them with the company's strategic goals to ensure success long term, whether it's our people, our policies, our procedures, we're going to have issues that we need to deal with right away that happened yesterday. Right before Christmas, I had a full out brawl on a job site. I can't predict that that guy is going to hit that guy, right? So that's reactive and I have to be able to deal with that. But how do I, how do I look forward and strategically align the HR things we do in the company to better you know, better prepare our staff, better prepare our systems. It's, it's anything from firefighting to completely setting your sights and goals on the next five to 10 years. And so if you're not looking ahead and you're always looking behind, then HR is not going to have that strategic place at the table, which is really important. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Uh, please describe what you consider to be a typical career path for an HRM professional. What are the types of entry-level jobs in HRM and where can they lead? Any general advice on HRM careers uh, today and tomorrow is welcome. Well, typical you know, HRM career, I mean, we all had different kind of careers in human resources and how we landed in HR, so um, just, you know, it depends on kind of your background, education, but if you're really interested in a human resources career, there's several paths. Even if you have an undergrad degree in a different field, you can still go into HR and take courses and you know, get your designation. Um, as an HR professional, you still need to know uh, finance and accounting uh, because those courses will also help you, uh, you know, uh, in your HR career. You know, 
like we do budget management, we work with numbers, all the programs or services that we develop uh, at our organization, you have to prove and kind of the return on investment and, and show you know, the benefit of having those programs in place. So, uh, um, and so kind of my uh, background, like I did my undergrad in business and hospitality, but then I moved into doing my master's and then getting the designation. Um, for in, in terms of careers, entry-level careers, um, you know, there's HR assistant, HR coordinator, kind of the entry-level where you support um, the HR team with kind of benefits, payroll, HR projects, and it's, you know, my advice when somebody's looking for a career in HR is look for more of a generous, you know, role when you um, go in, you know, as a first entry-level job, because that will give you a very good understanding of human resources and the different areas um, that HR impacts the organization. So whether, you know, working on, you know, salaries or compensation, payroll, benefits, um, recognition, training and development. So as a generalist, you gain a really good understanding, and then you can uh, move up, you know, where uh, if it's a specialized role, for example, you, you really like compensation. You can be a compensation specialist. Or if you really like, like the training and development side of HR, then you can be a learning and development specialist. So there are different positions that exist out there that somebody can be specialized in. Uh, or continue to be a generalist and then move into a uh, more of a senior management role in HR where you oversee, um, you know, an HR team uh, and uh, be on the kind of more of the strategic HR and be with the executive team and senior management team. So that's kind of a higher level uh, um, of a senior role kind of once you have several years of experience in HR. I'm going to add something to that. Um, I think it's wonderful that we're here sitting on an HR panel today, and I'm, my panel members might, you know, slap me for saying this since we're all in HR, but I think the most important thing to ask yourself is, what do you value and what do you want to do? Because it's easy for us to sit here and say, you should go and be um, an assistant and a generalist and all those things, which they're all great entry-level careers and you'll move through, but none of us sitting here went through that path Correct. Like it wasn't. It wasn't a straight line like that. So, ask yourself what you value. Look to see what types of com companies align with your values, um, and then see where the types of industries that you want to fit in, and see how you can you can make that happen because it's not going to fall in your lap. That's not how it works today. You're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to understand. You're going to have to be proactive. You're going to have to network, which we'll talk later about. But you, you really should ask yourself what you value and what you want to do and what do you like to do. I like people. I like talking to people. I like building relationships. I like firefighting. Like I like fixing problems. I don't want to do that every day and deal with brawls on the, on the work, work floor, but I, I like that. And I knew, I didn't know when I graduated that I was going to be a VP of human resources. I really didn't know that. Um, but I'm really happy with what I do today and I wouldn't change any of it, but it took me a while to get there. So really ask yourself, what excites you? What are you passionate about? What industries are you excited about? And you know, do you, do you align from a values perspective with company X, Y, or Z? And I think to build on that, if you know HR is of interest to you, and there are probably some of you in the room that are thinking, I want to be in HR, but I don't know how or what, it really is that kind of generalist position. Get in somewhere and see, try as much as you can. My first role was a maternity leave contract. I had bills to pay. I was terrified to take a 12-month contract, but it was the only thing out there at the time, and I thought, I need experience. And so I kind of took that leap. I could have taken, I worked at a pool. I was an aquatic supervisor going through my education to pay for my education, and I could have stayed there, and I could have managed lifeguards and taught swimming lessons, and that would have been great, but I needed to take that step to get experience, and what it did was it I, all of a sudden, 
I, it was a very entry-level job. It paid a very entry-level salary. I ate a lot of craft dinner. I kid you not. But the experience was incredible. I ran payroll. I administered benefits. I did labor relations, had employee concerns. But it's where I started to learn what I liked and didn't like about HR. And that's okay because we're not all meant to like everything. I thought recruitment was going to be the coolest thing in the world. And then I had to mass recruit for new nursing homes, and I did not want to look at another resume. It took me about six months before I wanted to do recruiting again, to be really honest with you. But that first job really showed me what I wanted to do, and I really liked that generalist position. Um, from there, I, the company kept me and moved me to another facility, and I had a full-time job. So my thing would be take the chance, even if you're not 100% sure, if you like HR but you don't quite know what aspect, look for an HR assistant role, look for a generalist role that will open your eyes to everything as opposed to one thing that you think you might like. Wow. <laughs> How do I? No, I think, and again, you, you have to find out what, what, what you really want to do. Um, I like the hunt. And I like closing the sale. And that's why town acquisition is a great place for me to be from an HR perspective. Uh, I guess the only thing um, that I would add to what all my peers said is that if you can't find a human resources role right out of the gate, try and find a position that's going to help you develop similar competencies. So something that's going to involve a lot of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, um, you know, ethical sustainability, all of those types of things that will help you as you're building your resume and you're gaining experience in those first couple of years after graduation that will help you much easier transition into a human resources career path if that's what you decide that you want to do. Okay, perfect. Okay, next. Uh, diversity management is another important strategic HRM topic. Please describe diversity management initiatives, which you have observed, what they were targeting, how they were in implemented, and any general feedback on the topic. Leanne's very excited to answer this. Uh, my colleague at the end of the panel, I'm just joking. Um, um, diversity management, I, I, what is diversity? Um, wh what does that mean? It means something to me, it means something to them, and it means something to each and every one of you, and that may be different. Um, in terms of, I'm gonna speak directly and cut me off because I could go on and on here, but uh, what Maple Wave, uh, when I joined Maple Wave, um, they said, oh yeah, we're very diverse. You know, we operate in like 40 different countries and we have lots of like great people here from like, like all over the world. I'm like, okay, well, well, how does that make you diverse? Well, because we operate in all these other countries and whatnot. That doesn't make you diverse. But when I started to dig and I started to figure out what they meant by that, diversity, the meaning to Maple Wave is diversity of opinions, right? So they respect and they value the opinion of each and every person in that building. Um, how do they do that? By defining that and respecting that. So just because I say X doesn't mean that's, you know, that is, that is, that is the gospel or because she says Y, it doesn't mean that that's right. They really take that into consideration. We do operate in 40 different countries. We do have significant number of countries. I should know the number. I want to say it's 14 different countries represented in, in our building. I will have to check that stat. But that makes us think differently. That makes us not be so narrow-minded. That makes our product global. That makes our little headquarters in Dartmouth or in Burnside, Nova Scotia, a global company that's been running for 30 years. Um, so another initiative, we defined that as a company and we, we just made that a little bit more solid. So then when the company started to grow, we realized, well, how are we going to sustain that? We're growing, we're growing, growing. Our, our leadership table is 50% females. When I started, it was zero. Um, and that wasn't just check a number, Leanne, you are a female, you're going to go on the leadership table. That was, that was warranted by the value, the opinion, the role, how that was going to make us better. And every decision that we make, we don't 
we don't necessarily say, okay, you know, does this have a diversity angle? But that, that is part of our behavior. It's part of our norm. We've built that into our DNA. We've built that into our values, how we build our product, how we recruit, how we um, projects and different programs, how we look at, the, you know, our community involvement. We take that across everything that we do. So the first thing that we did, and I think it's very important, is we defined what diversity meant to Maple Wave. Not me as a person, but what does diversity mean to Maple Wave as an organization? We communicated that out. We stand behind that. We remind ourselves of that. And we weave that definition into everything that we do from what I just had noted there. <laughs> um, well, just to add to my colleagues, uh, comments, I mean, it's uh, really diversity, it's, it is very kind of, you know, subjective, you know, do you mean something else, like to us, maybe something else, but really, it's diver you know, for us, for the credit union, is diversity of people and thoughts and ideas, um, so it's the culture that we create, uh, and accepting each other's differences, each other's opinions, um, and really creating internally, you know, uh, an environment of openness and people not be afraid to speak up or to challenge the status quo. Um, in terms of, you know, defining diversity and having kind of diversity strategy, we're just starting, we're, we're embarking on this journey and uh, this year we're planning kind of diversity and inclusion because they go hand in hand, uh, training for our employees. But training is not enough, just one day, two day training. <coughs> it's more kind of the, the behavior. Um, and, uh, and really introducing some f flexibility in our policies um, and reaching out to community groups. So we partner with ISANS. We have a very good partnership um, with Ability Nova Scotia, with Halifax Partnerships, and with the communities that we have our branches. Um, we also partner with different organizations and not-for-profit. Uh, and do a lot of outreach in the communities that we serve. Um, we also designated an employee in the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. Again, kind of a different, you know, part of our diversity and becoming more diverse as an organization. But again, it's the people, but also diversity of thoughts. And, uh, and really creating that environment um, and that flexibility and encourage, you know, being diverse and accepting of each other's differences. Um, I think that's great. I think that, you know, when we first look at diversity at enterprise, you know, we really want our employees to mirror, um, you know, the communities in, in which they represent. Um, obviously, you know, I always love to tie it back to town acquisition that begins with hiring and selection. Uh, just, uh, but, you know, really it comes down to culture, as you mentioned, uh, and making sure that it, you know, celebrates and understands the value of diversity. Um, this also can't be an HR initiative. This has to be a leadership initiative within an organization because if your leadership isn't on board, um, your programs, whatever you're trying to implement, will not be successful. Um, so there's a number of different, you know, training that we do with, you know, uh, various levels of our management. Um, you know, we have everything from, you know, formal and informal um, diversity mentorship programs. I think that, you know, that's one of the questions to ask, um, you know, here in the question is, um, you know, I think when you come to formal programs, you need the right people um, to be part of those, both as mentors and mentees. Um, at Enterprise, we have individuals um, applied to that. We give them specific training. Um, and then we also have to measure outcomes as well. So is what you're doing, you know, trying to achieve whatever you goal you set out from a diversity standpoint, you know, in the beginning. I think that, um, you know, an organization has so many different um, measurables um, that they can look at. You know, one of the things um, I first dove into is looking at our female diversity um, um, at our middle management, um, which looks really great. Um, however, you know, when I kind of dug into that and I look at, well, how many, uh, you know, women are leading our impact stores? Because if you're in an impact store, you're more likely get to get promoted to that next position. So I think that um, you have to be really honest with yourself um, and your organization and identifying, you know, where your areas of opportunity are um, and, you know, setting goals, um, you know, from those measurables. And to that point, it, 
diversity is really everybody's responsibility in the organization. And so that is for us, like I said, we're restructuring. We've been kind of rebuilding HR as a company for the last two years, almost two years. Um, but for us, we have a diversity and inclusion committee at work that's combined of field employees, office employees from different provinces that really looks at how can we be more diverse and how can we be more inclusive in every area of the business? It isn't an HR initiative. And I know someone, a few people have said that already, but it's really important to say that again because it's not HR's responsibility to roll out these policies and make sure they're all happening every day. It's everybody's responsibility for the company. So to me, that's a big thing. And luckily our company, you know, we do community partners and ISANs and we have great partnerships, but it really is about everyone, whether you're working in the field, working in the office, working in PEI, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, how do we make this company as a whole more diverse? And that's what we're working on. I'm going to add one thing to that, sorry. It's important to note that it's not just our companies sitting up here and the other companies around. You're seeing so many more initiatives come out of, you know, uh, community groups, but also governments and whatnot. Um, and they're really they're enabling and they're supporting the work that all of us are trying to do and the companies are trying to do, it, it shouldn't be an afterthought anymore. It, it's, it's a critical component to business. It's also a critical component to the economy here in Atlanta, Canada, for all of you that want to stay here and work here in Nova Scotia. Okay, perfect. So question five. <laughs> yeah. We'll start with Katarina. Um, so, recruitment and selection are HRM activities which interest students in almost any field. For students entering the workplace soon, in any field, please offer any job-seeking str strategy advice. Examples can be networking, use of social media, resume, volunteering, co-op, etc. I think everybody's going to say networking, so I'm going to leave it for other people to talk about. Volunteer. There are a lot of things, and this panel is going to talk about a lot of other things once I stop talking, but volunteer. The volunteer work and the experience you get is just as valuable on your resume. If you can't get that entry-level HR job, if you can't find something that you're looking for, volunteer work is the same thing. As an employer, that's what we're looking for, that you know how to build relationships, you know how to communicate, you know how to work with others, you know how to work with different personalities, different groups of people. That's really important. Um, so I could touch on all of those things that you talked about, you know, co-op placements, but really, right now, if you're not volunteering, I know you're busy, school's exhausting, but if you have a chance to volunteer, do it and put that on your resume because that's something to be proud of and that's something that as HR professionals and recruiters, that's what we're looking for. Absolutely. I think that um, every day you are networking. So whether that's at work, you're volunteering, you're involved in a student group or any type of extracurricular activity, um, you're showcasing your personal brand. And the more opportunities to have that, the larger your network will be. And, you know, typically the more opportunities would then you know be presented to you i think that you know, when you're networking we can talk about your elevator pitch but you really have to understand you know who you are what you do and why you do it why you're passionate about it and what value that can bring to an organization so any opportunity you have to you know develop those competencies you know that i mentioned earlier um, you know that's just one more thing that you can put on your resume and i'll talk a little bit more about your resume i think in the next question um, one other thing i would just say you know when it talks about um, social media uh, something that i do in town acquisition is i actively pursue passive candidates online for jobs so one of things you have to think about is can employers find me so we have applicants who apply to jobs but uh, there's many organizations that go out and actively use resources such as LinkedIn and Indeed um, to find qualified applicants for the jobs so um, you know knowing that you are utilizing those resources and making it attractive if an employer came off sorry came across your resume on LinkedIn for example do you have the necessary information there that's going to make them want to send you a message and protect, potentially bring you in to their application process. So similarly, like volunteering is 
is very important and kind of we look when we see kind of candidates or and one of the interview questions that we'll talk after too uh, is asking about volunteering what volunteer experience you have um, also take advantage of resources at your university like your career services have a you know the LinkedIn profile is important kind of be out there if you're interested in a certain organization or employer you can follow them on their LinkedIn page all employers now have uh, you know on social media they're very active um, the nice thing then you know when you graduate it is kind of a job seekers market uh, you know years ago when I graduated this is 20 years ago it was the opposite there were limited employment opportunities so you're lucky in a way that when you graduate it is it is war for talent now the employer is actually selling the company and selling the position and 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 promoting so the table has turned a little bit um, but be active, uh, I, you know, see if you can, if, uh, you know, with your peers or your professors, uh, uh, you know, ask them for uh, any kind of different contact that you would like to connect with. Um, uh, be involved, whether it's a, with the university or with association or charities that you're really passionate about. Um, so kind of building your network, like my colleague said. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next one. Uh, so interviews are important for job seekers and hiring managers. Please share some of your favorite interviewing tips and techniques for both sides of the table. And we'll start with Leanne. Oh, I thought it was that. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay, uh, interviews, show up on time. Um, that's really important. Uh, not not to laugh, but I, there's nothing that boils my blood more than you know booking uh, an interview and blocking out my calendar and sending a lovely invite and setting everything up and having the room ready and all that stuff and having other people's calendars scheduled and the candidate being five minutes late. I couldn't find the place or I'm sorry I got stuck in traffic. Well, you should have left 45 minutes ago. So be on time. Things do happen, but take the two minutes to send an email call, just be courteous, right? Respectful of time, that's really important. Um, don't take anything for granted in the interview. Do not assume that the people sitting across from you have done their job. Now, I can guarantee you that we will all have done our job, but do not take for granted that the uh, the manager of department X or someone else that's not in HR that has to focus and have, know everything about you has done their job. They're busy, they're running a mile of minute, they're, they're wearing multiple hats. It is your time to shine. It is your time to tell us everything that you can. It is your time to demonstrate how you can solve the solution that we are trying to solve by hiring this role. So, you know, talk about your school projects. Talk about your cross-functional skills. Every one of you here have probably done group work, which means you've had to really focus in on your communication skills, how to be a team player, how to work with different personalities and all those things. Those are skills that employers want. That tells us that you're coachable. That tells us that you are adaptable and that you can, you can work here. Technical skills are just as, um, from a tech perspective, technical skills are important, but you can also learn them. If you're smart, you can learn things, you can pick it up. It's the softer things that for us, we are really assessing, because culture is really, really important in our building. We wanna make sure that you're here, you're gonna fit with the team, you're gonna jive, you're gonna have fun, you're gonna work hard, you wanna grow with us, all those things. So don't take anything for granted when you're sitting, sitting across the table. The other thing before you get to the interview that I think is really important, uh, my two students up there will remember this, this was on our exam, um, but remember that just because you get an email and you're invited to an interview, don't respond with thank you, ask questions. It's your time to seek information. That's Prep starts the minute you put your application in. Ask who's gonna participate in the interview. Ask for their names, then go look them up. Look up Leanne Dingwall, figure out what I do in the building, check my LinkedIn profile, look at my history, try to find a way that you can weave in a relatable component or ask something. L understand what's happening there. Also, read about the company. You don't have to have everything memorized. There are, I'm, I'm taking everything that they're gonna say. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, but 
read about the company, know about their mission, know about their values, know about how they're involved in the community, know about the product, know about all the different little things. You don't have to have it memorized, but you want to be able to have a dialogue, you want to be able to have a conversation, and you want to see them, you want them to see that you can fit and that you can relate and that you're here, you want to be here. I mean, those are the, the key things. Don't show up late, read about the company, figure out who's on the panel, and do not take anything for granted, because I can tell you, I have sat in a room where my colleagues have not read the resume, have not read my, my brief notes, and they're looking at a piece of paper. So can you walk me through your history? Like, they, they haven't done it. And it's not out of disrespect, it's out of a time factor. Well, just to add to the, those very good points. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, it is like an interview, it is a dialogue between the employer and the candidate. So it's your opportunity too to ask about the organization, you know, what, uh, uh, and show enthusiasm. Be honest, you know, on your resume. Uh, whatever you put on your resume should be the truth and not kind of put stuff that you haven't done um, because that's something that we can tell when we ask those questions. So uh, be honest, be transparent. Uh, we all have transferable skills like in your academic uh, experience. Those are transferable skills to the work environment. Um, and also, I mean, usually at the end of the interview, we ask, do you have any questions for us? You know, have some questions, uh, you know, to the employer because it's your opportunity to gain more information. So. Uh, it's, it's a little bit disappointing when we hear some candidates, you know, sitting in front of us and after all kind of an hour interview and we ask, do you have any, any questions? And they say, no, thank you, we don't. It it's, it's doesn't show that, you know, the person is really after one hour of conversation and they don't have really something more to kind of to add or to ask about. So uh, be yourself and, um, and be professional. Um, so again, arrive you know, a few minutes early, uh, shake hands, and after the interview, you know, send a thank you note, uh, if not kind of the panel, like the interview panel, but even to the HR person to thank the people who were there during the interview. So kind of a short thank you note um, and reminding them why you're the best candidate for the role. Absolutely. Um, I think that I'm just going to backtrack for one second. Um, your resume will get you the interview and your interview will get you the job. So if you haven't started on the resume piece, you're going to miss out on the job offers. So um, looking for a job is a job um, and there's a lot of work that goes into it and I can guarantee that the more you work put into it, the more you will be successful um, in obtaining, you know, the, the type of employment that you're looking for. Um, you know, coming back to researching on the organization and the job description, that is going to help you tailor your resume so the employer can see, okay, this person, based on what I can see in front of me, I believe has the competencies that I'm looking for, as Leanne said, to you know solve whatever problem that employer is looking um, to fill. It will also help you anticipate the types of questions that you're going to be asked. So for example, um, on our website, I don't know how many times the term customer service is listed, but I guarantee you it's a lot. And so if you haven't come to the interview with me with some questions kind of ready to go in the bank about customer service, exceeding expectations, overcoming challenges, um, then you probably haven't done the proper homework. And it isn't just about, you know, memorizing as well. So it's great if you're able to list, you know, to me the, the founding values of our organization, but I really want you to tell me why those values are important to you, how you identify with them. Um, because again, you know, we're looking to hire people. We want to hire you. I want to know as much as I can about you. Um, because even if you have the competencies for the job, is this the right environment, you know, for you? I want to make sure that I'm giving you as much information as I can. So the more information you can give me about you, the more information I can provide in return. Because, you know, as we've all talked about here, an interview really, um, is a dialogue, and I, I think the last point I'll make, because I can talk about interviewing for a very, very, very long time. Um, sometimes people say the right 
thing, but they don't have the passion behind what they're saying. So I think that, um, you know, it's okay to be nervous for an interview. Sometimes when somebody's not nervous at all, it just makes me wonder if, you know, they're trying to, yeah, do you, do you really want to be there? So you really just have to show your enthusiasm um, for the position. And at the end of an interview, ask for the job and certainly have questions. There, I will very specifically sometimes hold back information um, because I have questions about the match of the candidate and I wanna see if they are asking that question um, and really trying to learn more about the organization. I'm trying to think of some things that haven't been said, but a big one is to be yourself. I know that sounds so simple, but that's exactly what we're looking for. So if you are nervous, it's okay to be nervous, but believe in yourself. Know what skills you have to bring. I've interviewed for jobs that I thought were my dream job, and I got down to the final two candidate, the candidates that I had to do this big presentation, and I remember feeling heartbroken when I didn't get the job. And then the more I followed the company and kept looking, and the company I ended up at at instead was a perfect fit for who I was and what I was looking for. So you have to put yourself out there. You have to be completely yourself, know what you bring to the table, and do your research. That sounds so simple, but I had a guy read our website word for word to me in an interview. He had it memorized and he closed his eyes when he said it. We don't, like, I know when the company was established, I really do. That's not what I'm interested in. What about and it could be any company I've worked for, but what about the company made you want to come today? So what I loved about Lindsay Construction was their, what they do for the community and how they give back to the community. And so for me, that was the, my first thing with them was Hospice Halifax. Okay, so I said, talk to me about hospice. And it threw them off because they didn't realize that it wasn't me listing all the company or the community partners they'd worked with. I spoke to one and it was because I came from seniors care. And that was important to me. Um, another part is if you don't know, if they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, it's okay not to know. And it's also okay to take a second to breathe. So a lot of candidates think they have to answer, like, you know, so I could use a terrible question, but, you know, tell me your strengths. And then they, they just launch. They don't think, they just launch into speaking because they think that the dead air is bad. We get it. We have to think. I just had a ton of time to think, and I wrote notes. So take that time if you need a second, they understand that. Another thing, if you don't understand the question, because sometimes we write very confusing questions, ask them to repeat it, that's okay. You're nervous, and like, <laughs> like we were saying, if you're not nervous, there, if you're not a little bit nervous, there's probably a little bit of a problem. So ask for that to be repeated if you need it, that's not a bad thing. The last thing I'll say, which is more of a pet peeve, is if you're providing references, please tell the references you've used them. There is nothing more awkward than calling a reference and them saying, oh, I didn't know she was looking for a job. Or if it's their current employer and their employer doesn't know. So one thing we always do is we always say, we're going to call your references. Are they aware we'll be calling? So a kind of perfect example of that is I have references that I use and if I apply for a job, I give them the job posting. Here's the job I've applied to. Here's my up-to-date resume, right? They know what I do, we've been contact enough. Provide them with all the information they need so that they can speak to the right things because reference checks aren't very long. It's not 45 minutes on the phone, well, sometimes, depending on who you get on the other end, but give them all the information. Set yourself up to succeed from the second that that invite goes out to the second they call your references. Okay, thank you. And our last question. So career management is important for individuals and organizations. Please share any general career management advice. Perhaps share some examples from your career of things that helped you advance and maybe did not. Examples can be your education, special projects, uh, promotions, coaching, etc. Well, once you kind of, you know, um, you, know you get your foot in the door in the organization, we never stop learning. Uh, you know, every day is a learning experience. Um, but take advantage of kind of the training and development budget that, you know, the company has. Uh, you know, we at the credit union, we have kind of a dollar amount for 
training and development for each of our employees. Some of them take advantage of it every year. Uh, they sign up for courses, they sign, you know, uh, depending on where kind of their career development and what, uh, you know, courses they're interested in. But others, they don't take advantage of it. Um, so that's one is like, you know, for those things, you know, continue, uh, you know, learning and developing your skills and knowledge. Uh, attend events, conferences. Um, one of the things that the company paid for me was the designation. Uh, you know, um, I spoke to my CEO at that time and I said I would like to pursue this. Will the credit union pay for the designation and recertification every year? Um, so some things, you know, that you can also ask your employer to support you in your career development. Internally, you know, I have a mentor internally for many years, um, my colleague, and uh, kind of we connect on a regular basis and, uh, and discuss, you know, different things. Sometimes, you know, I seek her input and advice. So you can identify also internal mentors and, um, and uh, uh, ask for, you know, advice and, and, and also, you know, for career or personal development. Um, committees, uh, so there's various in internal committees, like at the credit union we have many internal cross-functional committees. Uh, and again, show your engagement um, by participating on those committees if you're going to an organization and they give you that opportunity. Uh, it shows, you know, leadership, engagement, um, and also you connect you learn a lot, uh, you know, working on a project or working on a different initiative and be part of something that you're supporting the organization with. So there are various things that a person can do once they join an organization and kind of gain further knowledge and development for, on a professional or personal basis. There we go. Sorry, guys. Um, a couple things I wanted to touch on um, was, you know, obviously we're all working in a team. We talk about teamwork and collaboration. Um, but you also really have to own your co contributions to the organization. So when you're interviewing for jobs within your organization or outside of your organization, um, you can really speak to how you've made a direct impact, um, you know, to the success of the business, but then also to, um, you know, the culture of the organization. Now myself, you know, in, in talent acquisition, um, there's four of us in our HR department here in Atlantic Canada, even though talent acquisition is, is technically my job responsibility, responsibility, you know, there's a lot of things that I do in training development, um, you know, work with our generalists. I'm always there to say yes and to help. And that goes for departments um, outside of human resources as well. So, um, you know, because of the way I was representing myself in, in certain parts of our organization, you know, I got brought on to our government relations team. And it was a really great opportunity opportunity for me to see a different side of our business and, and uh, you know, represent the company. So I think that, um, you know, again, find the mentor, find somebody that you aspire to be. Um, but then in addition to mentors, um, you know, look for sponsors, you know, be able to talk to people again about your contributions within an organization. So if there's a group of people in a room who are talking about a position and who they feel, you know, in the organization could be a match for that, the more people that can speak to you, your abilities and your successes, uh, the more successful candidate you'll be for those positions. So I'm going to take this question by the root of telling you what I did and what I should maybe not have done. Um, I did the same thing. I jumped on committees. I was in an entry-level position. I wanted to grow. So I jumped on committees. I asked a lot of questions. And after my first job, I found myself managing a team of 17 people, multi-million dollar budget, and I was 24 years old. And I thought, um, like I felt like an imposter every day. I thought, oh my goodness, do they know how old I am? And so one day I actually reminded my boss, like, hey, yeah, so I'm turning 25 this year, like, because I actually thought they forgot for a second. And I thought, this is a lot of responsibility. Am I qualified? And I knew I, that I wanted to do it, and I loved coming to work every day, but there were some skills that I didn't have that that role really needed. And so for me, I went back to school. 
I thought I need, you know, I, I was doing the job and I was doing it well, but I wanted to do it really well. And so I did an MBA part-time nights and weekends after work because I didn't want to stop working. Um, so I did that for three years and really got those skills that kind of helped me I, like excel in that role, I guess. In that time, I changed to a job at head office and dealt more with labor relations and kind of went more specific into one area of HR. But I guess out of that, I'm glad I got the experience I did. I was terrified for a few months every day driving to work thinking, I think they're going to figure out that I'm 24. But I really, by going back and learning and continuing to learn, it gave me this incredible insight to how companies work. And I got that in my undergrad, and that was great. But I really wanted to be a leader and be a really good leader. And so whether it's continuing education, whether it's staying up to date with what's going on, going to conferences, meeting with people, meet, make connections, connect with us. Like, connect with people in HR that you can either have as a mentor or just someone you go for coffee with once a year because you never know where those connections can lead you. So continue to learn, like I said, whether it's a book, an article, or you go back to school. You're probably all thinking, I don't want to go back to school right now once you're done. But you may, and so keep those doors open and keep talking. Um, I only have a couple things to add. I think the best thing that I can, if I look back on my career um, and what I, what I learned from, from then and to where I am today is that I put my hand up. And I wasn't scared to put my hand up. I was that person that was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to put my hand up anyways because it sounds just like maybe that'd be cool and I might get some experience out of it. I might fumble. Um, but I put my hand up and, and sometimes I didn't get chosen when I put my hand up, but sometimes I did get chosen and I got experience. And I didn't succeed every single time. I, I failed miserably sometimes. But I definitely learned from every experience that I had. And I think that that is very important. Sometimes students, and I can say this because I teach part-time here, sometimes students take for granted um, you know, the education in terms of what you're, what you're doing. But every project in your class, every presentation that is on your course syllabus, it, it's an experience. And it will help you, it will set you up for when you have to present in front of the four of us someday. Because that can be really, really scary. And so all these experiences that you get to take, that you get to do in school or your first job or your volunteer work, that, like it's very valuable and don't take it for granted and put your hand up. And the other thing I think that is a lost skill that I learned in my, doesn't, I'm not demonstrating it today, but um, that I learned is listen. Listen to people around you. It'll help you be more self-aware. It'll help you understand what what is really happening. Take it all in. Ask questions, but listen to the response. Listen to what the leader is saying. Listen to what your colleagues are facing the challenges or your group members in your group. It's really, really important. It's all about learning. And you said it best. Like, you know, the more you can absorb, the, the, more, the more you can be prepared for when you're in that situation. And that will help with your career. And the last, the last thing is, if you seek feedback, apply it. Some of it will be relevant and some of it won't, but apply it. And think about it because I, 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 I wouldn't be in my position today if I didn't grow and I can't grow if I'm not if I'm not getting that feedback from the people my mentors my leaders my bosses um, it's not always going to be roses um, and sometimes it will be but but take that feedback and actually apply it and then I, I the, la the last last thing is have a lot of fun right if you're not having fun if you're not aligned with the company values that you work for as Aaron said like if the passion isn't coming out yeah. then take stock in that and move along there's all, there is lots of opportunities out there, um, but you got to have fun because you're going to spend a lot of time at work. So. Can I jump on that quickly? Yeah. HR is needed everywhere. So if that's it, is that you can go to different industries. I was in healthcare and then I went to construction. So find out what makes you passionate about going to work every day. You may not find it right away, but you're going to find it. But be very aware that you may not find it right away and keep asking questions and listening to get there because once you find it, it's really worth it. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, panelists. And now we're going to open it up to the audience. So we have a couple minutes left for a couple questions. If anyone feels comfortable asking, it's a small group, some lovely panelists that would love to answer. Does anybody have one? Yeah, okay, I'm coming. Hey, okay. Um, I was wondering when you mentioned volunteer opportunities, do you mean like more so in the community or like unpaid internship volunteer opportunities? I, like, I would say it could be a combination of both. I vo have volunteered at the curling club that I curl out of my whole life, and that's a very relevant experience. Um, but I've done unpaid internships as well to get more specific HR experience, which have been very beneficial. Regardless of what type it is, it's great on your resume, and that's something that you definitely don't want to leave off there when you're looking for jobs. Um, I would say, um, you know, I have a annoyance with unpaid internships. I think if you're working, you should be paid, but that's a separate conversation. Um, but yes, again, you know, volunteering um, at any point in your career, um, you know, something that you're passionate about will just keep you, you know, engaged. So I sit on a national board um, for the Canadian Association of Career Educators Employers because I really am passionate about connecting students um, to careers post-graduation. So um, your volunteering isn't just to start your resume. It's something um, that, you know, organizations will be looking for throughout your career. So whether it aligns with your community or your career path, you know, continue to seek out those opportunities. Um, don't stop. Just you have that first position and your, your first job to build experience. And to add to that, if you don't, some of you are new to Nova Scotia and to Halifax in particular. If you don't know or don't know where to get those opportunities, I can promise you that the school here will help you because there's opportunities within the mount to volunteer. Um, you can be part of one of one of the committees or whatnot that are the Student Union Association. I'm sure Miriam has a list of different places where people can volunteer their time. Um, but and I and I say that lightly, but it's true. So if you don't know, there's always someone that you can ask. There's always someone that you can seek that input from. Career services can also help. But I think a really valid point about finding what you're passionate about and applying that. It doesn't necessarily have to be in HR or or another field. It can be in absolutely anything because you'll learn cross-functional skills from, from volunteering. And just to add to that, I mean, also like not only the Mount, but also there's so many not-for-profit organization and they're looking for, you know, uh, always, you know, volunteers and support in their initiatives. So whatever you're passionate about, you know, it's out there. Uh, and it doesn't mean every day you have to go and volunteer. You know, you have your academic work as well and you're busy, but, you know, to show that also you can spend some time and give back to the community, that's important for some organization. Awesome, and I just wanna add on to that. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Business and Tourism Society that we have here at Mount St. Vincent is a great opportunity for you guys to do some volunteering internally and externally. They don't just, um, it's not just a weekly meeting, it's its a lot of, of fun and uh, volunteering and, and giving your time and learning. So that's a great opportunity and so is the Learning Passport in general. Uh, there's an opportunity to just do 10 hours of volunteering and that can apply. Uh, so yeah, like she said, um, like Leanne said, if you have any questions about volunteering or the Business and Tourism Society, ask me or Miriam because we'd love to help. And yeah, does anybody else have any questions? No? I have a question for you guys. How many people here part-time work while going to school? Okay. How many people here are looking to get into HR when you're done school or think they want to get into HR? You should all be coming and talking to us afterwards. <laughs> 
Except for Leanne. She has to run. You have to run and pick up my kids. Yes. But <laughs> my emails are accessible. And if you really want to talk to me, find me on LinkedIn or ask Miriam. She has it. Okay. We would like to give a final thank you to all of our panelists who came here today. And thank you all for attending.